right into your experience being NIFTY teachers, um, working with the students. I have a few questions for you all. Um, now, in terms of teaching, right, how important would you say it is um, that a teacher um, kind of distills the information to our students? Like, how impactful is your role as a teacher for our students? And then, Misty, we can start with you. Sure. Um, I actually love that we are teaching the students real life um, skills that they need, even if they decide um, not to be an entrepreneur, but teaching the entrepreneurial mindset is really just getting them ready for whatever they decide to do in their future. Um, so I love how this kind of gives the students um, free range to kind of put whatever crazy ideas they have into action and really, really empower them as students. Absolutely. And then Ms. McNair, what would you say? I, um, I, I can concur with her. And there's some other things. I think, um, especially using like the Nifty curriculum, one of the things that my students have gathered is it doesn't matter whether you're working for yourself or you're working for another company, you still need an entrepreneurial mindset. It's about thinking outside of the box. It's about being innovative. And I think that's what's huge. And I think that's the biggest takeaway because the students say uh, uh, to me very frequently, this is something I can use outside of school. This is what school should be about, is preparing me for the next level. I completely agree, especially being an alumni myself, um, learning those different mindsets allowed me to apply myself past nifty programming, but into real, uh, real life solutions and situations. So diving deeper into the nifty curriculum itself, Ms. Strother, I'd like to ask you, how do you think that nifty curriculum has benefited your students in the classroom? Um, so being my first year teaching the program, I really appreciated how the entire school year was broken down into that lean canvas model and how it really allowed the students to have a deeper understanding of each part of what it takes to create your own business. And so I felt like we were able to dive in deeper than probably just skimming through um, you know, putting together a business plan and we were able to actually like learn the different pieces that make up the end result, which is what, what our goal was. Absolutely. And then Ms. McNair, what would you say? <clears throat> wow. She took so much of what I was going to say. So <laughs> it's all right. Um, I think the, the students take away from what we had, the, the real hands-on experience in the classroom is I think of what really benefits them the most and kind of helps as far as um, developing that mindset we want the students to have to think outside of their box. Perfect. And then Ms. McNair, we'll actually start with you um, with this next one. Since you mentioned the entrepreneurial mindset, you're familiar with the different EMIs, both of you, right? As you you instill those basics for our new students, right? So what would you say your um, most memorable um, EMI is and why? Um, having the kids become comfortable with risk. I think one of the things that um, a lot of young people, they immediately think, well, um, if I do this, if I try, try to create a, a business, do I have to have a million dollars? Do I, am I gonna lose a million dollars? You know, so it, getting them to help, help them to understand that you start small, you start with l a little bit, and then you move it forward. And it's okay if you lose a little, because you only invested a little right now so that when you do get to those larger opportunities, you'll know with how to handle yourself in, in order to not lose a great deal of money. And even if you do, you're going to gain regardless, because sometimes in losing, we win because we have that knowledge. I love that answer. Um, one of my biggest uh, gripes was comfort with risk. Um, and I've seen that with a lot of our students um, because I've uh, been able to uh, have the luxury of mentoring some of our NIFTY students hands-on. Comfort with risk is such a interesting concept to grab because of that fear of failure. We don't know if we have this idea and then if we launch it, is it going to be successful or not? But there's definitely wins and losses, so to speak, because it's all about learning and 
figuring out what works and what doesn't and innovating and moving forward. So absolutely. And then uh, Ms. Strother, what would you say to that? Um, actually, I'm saying the same thing. I think comfort with risk is um, one of the most powerful things that we can teach students. Um, being an entrepreneur myself, I know that you never grow being in your comfort zone. And so um, I guess above and beyond the investing part of risking, um, we also risk a lot of things every single day, standing up for what's right, um, talking in front of our peers, making presentations, talking with businesses. So I am, I, I wholeheartedly feel that comfort with risk is probably one of the most important life skills that you learn because you never grow by being comfortable. And so by pushing the students to do things that are uncomfortable um, is really where you start to see growth. So I definitely agree. <laughs> Yeah, and I, I love both of those answers um, because it, seg it segues into our competition season, which is rapidly approaching, right? And so a lot of our students are eventually going to pitch their ideas in front of panels of judges. Um, what, would you have, um, what would you say was the hardest part or maybe the most difficult concept to grab in terms of the business plan for the students? And then um, Ms. Strother, we'll start with you. Sure. Um, I think the most um, confusing part was the call structure. Um, I think that it took a lot of us sitting down and really talking about hypotheticals, you know, because we are we're putting together our own business models. And so we weren't talking factual information. And so I think that the students struggled with the call structure. And honestly, what we did was we dug deep into it. And then the students that really grasped that concept helped, helped meet with everyone that was participating within that pitch competition. So the call structure was definitely the, the struggle. <laughs> definitely. Um, and it also depends on if they're, uh, the student's business is a product or a service too. Um, a lot of times I've noticed where students are not sure if they want to pay themselves hourly for the labor that they put in, or if they're going to have employees. It's all um, a little bit difficult to dissect. So um, Ms. McNair, I'm going to ask you, and I'm going to ask a follow-up question. How do you help clarify those uh, confusions for your students in your class? So one of the things we did uh, we do this activity. It's, uh, it's called building, a, making a sandwich. So I start them to understand the economics of one unit. And, and that really gets them to start thinking about, OK, what did it take for me to get here to get this one sandwich? And then how many sandwiches do I have to sell in order to be able to meet uh, my obligations? So the kids kind of sat, sat there and said, OK, how do, how do we come up with how does it how is it that um, they can do five dollar footlongs? But yet, normally those sandwiches are a lot more expensive. So how do they make money by those sales? So we had to sit down and break it down into the, that little one unit and then expand that unit back out. And I will say that um, that was the hardest part was getting the money. It's always the dollars. The idea is there. The people are there. But when it's time for them to think about, OK, how do I make sure I'm making a profit? How do I know when I'm making a profit? So that was that was the hardest thing. And so again, I tried with them with just some small abstract item because everybody eats sandwiches and we can all start a little sandwich shop initially and then we move it forward. So even today, one of my students, we worked on one of her um on her business project and she wanted a restaurant and she went to, she looked at um, one of the local businesses here at the beach and their monthly rent was $44,000 for their business space. And she was like, that's why I spent $50 just to feed one meal with them, you know? So it's like, yeah, it starts to become real. So it came from that building that sandwich to going back to now let me pull some real numbers to see what real businesses have to pay for rent. And now I can actually start to say, okay, that's why it costs so much. So that cost structure is, has to be there. They have to get that understanding in. Absolutely. And I love how you were able to start from the beginning foundationally and kind of break down what each topic means and then showcase real world examples. I think that always helps students who are thinking thoughtfully kind of connect those dots. So that's amazing. And thank you both for that insight. Um, 
wrapping up sort of the nifty teacher experience, um, I do want to ask one last question. And that question is, how has nifty uh, supported you thus far in your process of kind of teaching your students this curriculum? And how can we better support you both in the future and all those teachers out there watching? Miss Vicky, can I go can first? start with you. Yes. <laughs> Um, Nifty was a godsend for me. I was, uh, we started the idea and the concept and when I got the curriculum and it had all these great activities, I am, I absolutely positively hate rote memorization. I don't like for a kid to sit there with a textbook and just read something and not have anything to apply it to. So using the Nifty curriculum, it gave us the opportunity to have hands-on every single lesson, had some type of little project, some kind of type of thinking outside the box that kind of got the kids stimulated. And even some of them, I had to kind of like alter them a little bit to fit my budget. Um, but that the curriculum itself really lends the opportunity for you to be able to get more hands-on experience so the kids um will learn and not realize they're learning so i the first time i get we did the esb was last year and i used I went all the way through the curriculum and one of my students was really intimidated um, about taking the esb exam and he passed the first try and he said that this has been this great experience is that I actually was learning without it being so hard and so stressful. I learned and it was fun. And that's, it was a great takeaway. He said, I didn't realize how much I was learning because I was having so much fun with this curriculum and the way that it was being implemented in class. And, and, and I was able to pass the test. So I was like, that's what learning should, that's the, what we want learning to be like. We want it engaging, we want it fun, and we want you to want to come back and get more. So with the curriculum, the support that we get from you guys, anytime I need to jump online, I can always get online with you or call Chris or text uh, Jen or anybody I need help from, always available, very, very helpful and hands-on. So my kids love it and I love it as well. Awesome. What she said. That was great. <laughs> um, no, I definitely love the hands-on um, aspect of this. Um, and I like the deeper thinking that comes along with that because they really never know what's coming at them when I hand them a bag of items that they have to create something with. Um, but, um, my students love, they love the hands-on learning. I actually had a student, um, just a couple of months ago say that, you know, they really enjoy that my class is really project based. And so, um, some of the other classes strive to be, but they always know that they're going to get something that's, that's getting them critically thinking about things in my class. And I, I mean, that's why we do what we do. Um, so I definitely um, appreciate all the support as well. I know that I can call Jennifer anytime um, and she's able to help me figure out ways to make submissions and whatever um, with the program. But I do love the program. I love that the program is a fun way to not necessarily teach to the test, but to get all the information and really grasp the knowledge that they need for the test. Um, and so I do, I do appreciate the program and I, I definitely um, look forward to continuing to use this program. Thank you both so much for those um, insightful, wonderful answers. Um, yeah, I want to go ahead and segue and shine a light on our curriculum team because they have a few things that they want to highlight, not for, um, not just for both you both as the panel, but also for our other Nifty teachers um, that are also disseminating this information. So I'm going to spotlight Christine Ryan, as well as Darlene Lacey, and I'll unpin myself and allow them to take the lead. Great, thank you, Benet. Um, I'm going to share my screen. I have slides because of course, we are the curriculum team, right? <laughs> you have to have slides. So just want to give a little introduction. So I'm Darlene Lacey, Nifty's Director of Product Strategy and Innovation. And I've been with Nifty now close to seven years. And it's exciting to hear you talking about the hands-on activities because that was one of the principal reasons why I was hired at Nifty was to help develop those investigations and activities because I come from the game design, computer game industry, and we wanted to turn that into a classroom kind of experience. 
So um, I'm out here in Los Angeles, and I think that's all I have to say. I'm going to pass it over to Christine. Hi, I'm Christine Ryan. I am the Curriculum Development Manager at NIFTY. I spent 17 years in the classroom um, in high school English, so I know your struggle. <laughs> <laughs> and I know the importance of those projects-based you know, classes and getting students interested. I, I always wound up with the seniors who were unsure what they wanted to do next. And by getting them to kind of explore things on their own and think about things in terms of real life, it would help them to kind of progress forward. Um, I have only been at NIFTY for a year. I was hired for my um, background in writing different curricula. I've written a lot of different ones over the years. And I previously worked at another ed tech company, but I'm on the East Coast up in Massachusetts now. Um, and I just, I love working on this. I, as you both were talking, I was thinking about this new course that we've been putting together and how it did a lot of the things that you were talking about. And it just, it made me really excited, you know, and to know that it has that positive impact. It's kind of more rewarding, you know, to know you've built something that will help students. <laughs> it's really true. And having fun while learning and also just really knowing, learning to, you know, understand the concepts versus teaching to the test is so important to us here at NIFTY. And I uh, wanted to introduce the three topics we're going to talk about in this curriculum focus session. Some of these overlap a bit with our intro, um, but of course they would because they're our pillars of instruction. We have the entrepreneurial mindset, lean startup strategies, and project-based learning. And these are all topics that not only are so important to facilitating NIFTY's curriculum, but really just for education overall. So I'm going to kick it over to Christine for the first question about the entrepreneurial mindset. So as most NIFTY teachers are familiar with, um, we have the, on, the eight entrepreneurial mindset domains. Um, and these are an important foundation for everything that the kids learn. And these are such important soft skills. I mean, research has shown how important soft skills are for students in real life. It not only helps them to work with others and independently in the workforce, but it helps them with conflict resolution and professionalism and just having stable relationships and success in their jobs afterwards. And so we've always, NIFTY has always focused on these. Next slide, please. <laughs> Um, and so, as you both mentioned, one of the ones that students struggle with the most, and this came up on my EMI, my lowest, was comfort with risk. Um, because I don't think as humans, any of us are comfortable with risk, or we might have like, know a few people that are, um, but most of the time we're kind of adverse to it. And I think that Darlene and I were having a conversation and she framed it in such a way that it made so much more sense to me. Being comfortable with risk is just having the tools in your toolbox to kind of predict what they are and think ahead of time about how you would handle certain risks. So to be comfortable with risks, we want students to be able to do things like evaluate costs and benefits when making decisions, anticipate those challenges, be open to different options. Um, knowing that you kind of hit a roadblock and you're like, okay, well, I guess this isn't going to work and being able to like look at it from a different perspective and take a different approach and develop a plan to achieve the goals. You know, they, a lot of times students will start out with one thing and end with something else and they don't even realize that that is comfort with risk. Um, so this is kind of double dipping a little because we talked about it earlier, <laughs> but are there any other strategies you have other than um, what you talked about that helps students understand what it means to have comfort with risk? And if we want to start um, with Deidre, and then we can go over to Missy. Um, <clears throat> pretty much just um, letting them know the importance of taking the risk and the being comfortable with not always being successful. I think, again, that growth mindset that kids need in order to be able to uh, accomplish any type of goal, you're always going to, there, there's going to be some failure the bottom line and having them become comfortable with that and understanding that all these different opportunities that you're um, looking for, if you're not willing to take a risk, you'll never be able to take advantage of any type of opportunity. So just working with them with trying to get them to understand that it's okay. It's okay for it to be scary. It's okay because in that scariness and that taking those little bitty steps, you're gonna eventually feel comfortable with knowing the possibility helping them see the greater possibility. 
Um, one of the ways that we practiced comfort, comfort with risk, um, you know, we just talked a little bit about it um, being pitch season, right, for the competition. Um, and basically what we have done here at our school is we put together a competition to kind of get them ready for the next level of competitions. And so the students, I had 11 students, they had to um, stand in front of their peers, 150 of their peers to pitch their business ideas. Um, and so not only did that push them outside of their comfort zone and to be extremely vulnerable, but also we had judges that gave them um, ways to improve their ideas and maybe what they were doing wasn't wasn't a hundred percent what they needed to be doing to take their businesses to the next level. So I think um, definitely, you know, the greater the risk, the greater the reward. So putting yourself out there, being uncomfortable, that's huge. Um, but also being able to accept, you know, criticism and make changes for the better. Also, I feel like goes hand in hand with this. Those are great points. You know, it makes me think about, they say that public speaking is like the most feared thing by most people. And uh, it's so interesting that it is. And I guess it's because you're really just kind of putting yourself out there potentially for critique or if you muff something, you know. Uh, but I think that's one of the great things about project-based learning and uh, having that evolving process where the students are sharing their work and talking and getting feedback all throughout the course so that they get used to it and they're all in the same boat, right? Like in the end, there may be judges with the competition, but um, at this point, they have you know at least gotten that feedback before and they can trust in the feedback. Um, I don't know if, it, yeah, very many people will ever be like 100% comfortable with risk, but it definitely helps. Uh, that takes us to our second question, our second topic, lean startup strategies. And here you see an image of the minimum viable product, which is one of those lean startup strategies. And you know, Nifty's curriculum, it's all about modern entrepreneurship and the tools that entrepreneurs use today. And it's called lean startup strategy. And the reason for this was in the past, when you were an entrepreneur, one of the biggest pain points was you would spend a year or two years developing your business plan and get it all figured out. And then you would take it to the investors or you go shopping around for that storefront for your sandwich shop or what have you. And you realize that you need to change it. Often is the case with feedback. You realize, oh, I'm going to have to change this. But now you have this enormous business plan and a lot of entrepreneurs would give up right then and there. So we really advocate this idea of getting feedback often and testing with it with tools such as your MVP. And that takes us to one of our central tools that we embed into Nifty's curriculum, the Lean Canvas. And the Lean Canvas is a graphic organizer, as you know, uh, for students to use as they build and develop their business plan. But teachers, they struggle with the idea of like, what is really the value of the Lean Canvas? How would I in implement it in my classroom? Yeah, and what are the benefits that it brings? And so uh, let's start with you, Misty. How do you implement it in your classroom? Um, I just think it's a simplified model of the business plan. So we just, we use this to dig deep in each of the sections and it just gives them kind of like a rough draft of what they're going to be working on throughout the curriculum. Deirdre, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, just, a, um, it's also a roadmap and it kind of like gets the kids understanding. So what we did was each time I would teach, um, we did ideation and then we came up with our three problems um, and then we added it to the, to, the, to the lean canvas. And so as some of the kids were like, well, I'm going to go ahead and fill out the whole thing and get it done early. And I said, do that, because as we continue to move forward, you'll go back and change and update things as you learn what it should be. So that actually helped as well. So the kids had a big idea and it took it from being this 25 page document or even a five to 10 page document to being this one big giant sheet. And it was so much 
easier. And it was, and it gives you the opportunity to kind of like see how all the pieces of the puzzle kind of fit together. So they started looking at, okay, this is my idea and these are my solutions. Okay, so, and then they, and they can actually plan it out. And then it's like, okay, so we're going to the next item. And so every time we get through with a different segment of the curriculum, we would come back to the Lean Canvas and say, okay, let's work on your product now. And that was proved to be helpful and it kept the kids engaged and more kids actually finished using Lean Canvas because when I first started out, we didn't, we actually used a business plan and that was a nightmare <laughs> and half the kids didn't do it. But I can honestly say that about 90% of my kids finish it well. That's so interesting. That's great to hear. I mean, do you find too that just being able for them to see the big picture like this in a very simplified view that they can sort of see the dependencies more uh, of like, if I'm gonna change this one thing, this would affect the other aspects of my business model? Absolutely, absolutely, especially when it came to the target market and the customer segment, because they then still had to go back and revisit some of the things that they wanted to do. And then they started looking at the when we got down to the cost structure and what did it really cost and how am I? they started looking, putting all the money in the pieces and everything kind of like went together. So absolutely, they get the, it gives them an opportunity to revisit areas when they say, well, if this is my target market, I may have to spend a little bit more money uh, than I anticipated. So I need to make sure that I have a more extensive marketing budget to get to these people. I love that idea. So I love that you took the that you took the lean canvas model and that you brought it back like every every time. So that is something that I look forward to trying to do next time because this is my first year teaching the program. But I love hearing that you allowed them to go all in and then make changes throughout the year. I feel like that's probably a, a lot deeper of a learning tool than, um, you know, some of us use it for. So I love that. The other thing that's really great about the Lean Canvas is when you do get to the pitch and you can look at the canvas with this very succinct overview of the business plan and say, uh, this is really how I boil down this idea. Because I think sometimes a long written business plan can make it hard to pitch and really say what is it so special about this business you know, plan or idea of mine. Have you found that as well? Sorry, I couldn't hit my mute button. <laughs> yes, definitely. With that unique value proposition, they even during the course of creating their pitches, sometimes they will go back and change that because they'll come up with a new way to say it or a more catchy theme or something like that. So that part gets rewritten probably more than anything else, their unique value proposition, because they, they realize that that what after they start researching, because I actually make my kids do a actual survey where they have to use um, they um, <clears throat> they use forms and they go back and they have to go out to their peers or whoever they think their target market is and do a survey. And I make them do 50 to 100 people. They've got to answer your survey so that you can now justify what you're trying to do. And in that process, sometimes they'll use their unique prop, uh, their uh, unique value proposition, their their clean statement, and saying, "This is what I'm trying to accomplish." And then they and then they get feedback on it. So it really is very helpful to be able to to, um, to see that. So absolutely. That's great. Well, thank you very much. It's really great to hear about just how the students are using it. Let's uh, go to topic number three, project-based learning. I'm gonna pass it back over to Christine. <laughs> Well, it sounds like both of you have fully embraced project-based learning, which is always something that I embraced in my classroom too. Um, I mean, I did research on it before um, our school, the last school that I worked for kind of transitioned to it. And we found that not only does it help them to practice important soft skills, i.e. the entrepreneurial mindset domains, but it also, as you both have highlighted, engages student curiosity. It gives them a feeling of responsibility for their own learning and their own education, which I feel like a lot of times students lack when they don't have something like projects-based learning. 
Um, and the fact that it helps them retain knowledge longer, because like you said, Deidre, I believe earlier, you know, you don't want them to just memorize things. You want them to learn it and understand it and personalize it and see the relevance in their lives. And, and I'm so glad to see that this does that for your students. And that's why we use this gold standard, you know. Uh, next slide, please. So um, as you're both familiar with, the particular way that Nifty does it starts off with that investigation. It kind of puts them in the pool and they're not really sure what they're doing yet, but they kind of swim around, you know, figure things out. And then we have the foundations. So it's the, you know, important information that they need with, for the lesson. Um, and then they have their lab where they can apply it to their own business. And then the flex day. And actually, it's not one of the questions, but I'm curious, like, how do you use your flex days in the classroom? And do you find that they're valuable? Um, we can start with Deidre and then go to Misty. Absolutely, because sometimes um, we get the opportunity to go back and revisit. We may want to take a little bit more time. Um, or if we don't need to use that day, we may even get a little bit ahead of schedule. So the flex day definitely gives you the opportunity to, I realize that when I get back and I start reading these reflections, that um, you guys didn't get it. So now I need to go back and do some reteaches. So it gives you the opportunity to do some reteach, to review, revise. And then a lot of times we'll use that extra time for them to do research and get more information about their product as well. So the Flex Day is very helpful. Um, I actually have a couple uh, side projects that I have that work parallel to this program. And so that's typically what I incorporate um, towards the flex day, um, where the students are able to take that concept and implement it within a project. I usually have them work in a group with something that is just parallel that I used with the Nifty curriculum. That's really good to know. Thank you both for sharing that. Um, okay, so some teachers, and I think you've probably worked with teachers like this too. I know that I did. They would skip the investigation piece and just go right for the foundations and then the lab. Um, but that's supposed to spark curiosity and get them interested. So what advice or insight might you share with teachers who do, do struggle with starting with that investigation? Um, and we can start with Misty and then go to Deidre. For um, sorry. I was distracted because somebody was at the door, but um, we are talking investigations. <laughs> okay, um, so I actually like starting with the investigations because I personally feel like um, the students thrive when they're thrown into a situation um, and they don't realize how much teamwork it takes to kind of put their brains together to come up with um, ideas that they don't realize that how that's gonna even transition into the actual unit. Um, but they work together. They think about things completely differently. Um, and as I walk around the room, surprisingly, the students that I would not think would be bought into the lesson are talking about all of the all of these entrepreneurial mindset um, things within the investigation. And so pe the, the students that typically wouldn't be engaged I feel like are really bought into the way that it's set up as far as the thought process and working together and learning how to put your ideas and opinions out there, but also be open to other people's ideas and opinions when you're trying to put together something for the group. Are you ready for me? Okay. I just did. You're, you're still muted. That's okay. Um, I like it because I use it as a hook. Sometimes we have to like introduce a concept that may be a little more difficult and it's an opportunity for you to break it down, let the kids start thinking about it and kind of get engaged in the new topic. So I, I love doing it because it's actually the hook. So I don't, I, I very seldom, in fact, I don't think I ever skip those because that's always the fun part, even for me. So I love it because that's the hook to get them engaged, to get them to start thinking about the subject area, taking an outside look at it and then taking that deep dive. I love that. It's like planting the seed. Like, here's the general type of thing we're talking about, like gets them to kind of think about it a little bit before you get into the foundations. I feel like it also helps them activate prior knowledge, you know, when they get into it and they start seeing these pieces and they're like, oh, and then they get to foundations and they're like, oh, I know how to do this. Like, it's so encouraging. And I think it helps 
students to be more successful when they kind of, you know, the pool metaphor, dip their toes in first and adapt and then learn how to swim. <laughs> and I think too that, uh, you know, to have these investigations, you know, they're they're light and they're fun and they're active. And so you're getting to see how would I use this? I think there's always that question, like, why do I need to know this? And so, and also like, is this gonna be too hard for me to take on? I remember when I first joined Nifty and I did my Nifty U, we did a sort of product innovation game kind of thing where we built a product we had that was just you know, some red cups and pipe cleaners and things like that. And uh, it was so surprising to me, not only did it, this group of people who had not met each other before be able to come up with a product in you know, 10, 15 minutes, but all the different products that came out of it from the different groups. And that was really, to me, like a transformational moment to say, you know what, maybe all of this really is possible. You don't have to be an entrepreneur or some expert to come up with a great idea or build something. It also helps them to respect each other too, I think. When they're working in these groups, you know, sometimes they'll get stuck and another student will come in with an idea. And then all you can see all the light bulbs kind of going off. And I think that helps them to to rely on each other to realize that, you know, they have resources in their peers and also not to be afraid when they have an idea because they see all these other cool things going on around them. It gets them out of their shell a little. <laughs> Do either of you have a favorite investigation or anything that uh, stands out from your experience with the class? Um, I liked the backpacks. They had to make the backpacks. Um, the kids carried them around all day. And I mean, it was, the, we took tons of pictures and we posted it on like our social media page, but um, all of all, it was very, it was very interesting to see the different um, thing, the different products that were created in that day. But that was one of my favorites for sure. Mine as well. I have um, morphed and evolved that. We started out doing all sorts of things and I had, you know, different size Ziploc bags and duct tape and all sorts of materials. And then one day I said, oh, wait. I was like, let me just see if I give them three different colors of uh, construction paper. And it's amazing what they came up with. That it's just, it's amazing. And they loved it. And it was a very abstract concept that, um, that we you're teaching with that. And it's something that they don't think about, but that's how products are designed. So yeah, the, that, that, the backpack is one of my favorites. That is so great. Um, anything else you, you would want to add, Christine, or anybody else about the investigations or anything else about the curriculum as if there's like one last uh, parting bit of advice that you would give to a new Nifty teacher, what would that be? I would say stick with it. Uh oh, I would say stick with it. Um, you know, I feel like in the beginning I felt overwhelmed because there was so much amazing information that I didn't want to do something wrong. <laughs> um, and so I would definitely say stick with it, ask for help, um, take your time um, to really dig through and look at all the information that you're given and um, it will pay off. And I think you'll be really happy um, that you've stuck with it, um, you know, come this time at the end of the year. Like, I'm very excited for next year. I'm already planning on getting my eighth grade team um, setting up for EE to get into E1. And then I'm excited to get the next level. So um, I'm excited to run with the entire program. And I think it's going to be amazing to have the platform set up to go into E1. So I couldn't be more excited for this program. Uh, same here. And own it, make it yours. It's um, it's really important that when you get into a curriculum of any type, and one of the things that I will say about uh, Nifty especially, it was so easy to alter it to my personality. So don't give up, it seems like a lot, and own it, make it yours. Go in and alter some of the things that they, the uh, materials, you think you need a lot, you don't. You just need some construction paper, some markers and some glue and some tape. And that's it. You'll be surprised at what these kids can create. So don't get intimidated by, you don't have all these other little items. You keep it simple, keep it simple and just make it yours. 
Well, thank you all so much for just providing your insight. Um, uh, Misty, Deidre, as well as Christine and Darlene, thank you so much for just shining a light on the insight that our Nifty teachers have. And today you've represented a lot of Nifty teachers out there that might not um, have the full scope of understanding of curriculum, which is why we're doing this own it session. So thank you guys so much for your time. And I would call that a wrap.